Hi, I'm Dr. Ed Meyer. Today we're going to be talking about gastroparesis. This is a uh, digestive dysfunction that I see quite a bit of. Uh, it's a diagnosis that sometimes is jumped to without doing the proper testing. So I've had quite a few patients with this. And I'm going to talk about what is it, what causes it, and more importantly, what can be done to correct it uh, from a functional medicine point of view, functional neurological point of view. I will state in the very beginning right now that the approach that we take from a functional medicine, functional neurological point of view versus the approach that traditional medicine takes are totally different. So if someone out there is suffering with gastroparesis and, um, and you're not getting answers, pay attention. We're going to go through this, uh, this whole video here and, and you're going to really get some good information. So what is it? Okay, It's a delayed stomach. Gastro means stomach. Paresis means paralysis, so paralysis of the stomach. You're not emptying the stomach. The food in your stomach is not emptying, and there's no obstruction. So the obstruction has to be ruled out via, via an endoscopy, and then there's a test that we're going to go over that actually confirms this diagnosis. So there's, it's a delayed stomach emptying of food without any obstruction. So gastroparesis, this is the esophagus, small uh, stomach, and small intestine. And it should, food should empty in a timely fashion from the stomach into the small intestine. Food does not get absorbed in our stomach. Food gets absorbed in our small intestine. So, and when things are inside of our stomach and, and intestines, they are still on the outside of our body. Having our nutrients in our stomach and small intestine is like having gasoline in little five gallon gas tanks in the back seat of our car. It doesn't do you any good. They gotta get absorbed in the bloodstream. The stomach prepares our food for absorption in the small intestine, and in the small intestine, our nutrients get absorbed into the bloodstream and get carried to the entire body where they're needed. So the symptoms of gastroparesis are acid reflux and GERD, because the stomach's not contracting. The, the nerves that control the stomach are not working. And we're going to get into why in a little bit. So the, the food stays longer in the stomach, and the longer it stays in the stomach, the acids you do have will get pushed upward into the esophagus. So that's why GERD and acid reflux can be a symptom here. Folks, our stomachs are super, super acidic when they're healthy. And that's by design because we are supposed to break our food down pretty quickly when we eat it. And also the acids are there to kill things, uh, germs that we all eat. And when the food leaves our stomach to go into the small intestine, it's the acidity of our food from the stomach that will trigger pancreatic function and gallbladder function. All right. Now, nausea and vomiting because you're not emptying and the food gets uh, pushed back upward. Weight loss because we're not absorbing our foods and so we get nutritional deficiencies. Bloating, gas, really basically any GI gastrointestinal complaint can be a result of this. So now because the food is sitting too long in the stomach, the acids are in there too long, you're not emptying, and they can erode away at the gastric lining causing ulcerations. And as I mentioned, you're gonna, people will have poor gallbladder and pancreatic function because we need proper acidity and exiting of the food from our stomach to trigger the gallbladder and the pancreas. Now the biggest concern with gastroparesis is malabsorption. Without food leaving the stomach and being properly prepared for absorption in the small intestine, we won't absorb our nutrients. So we get nutritional deficiencies which can lead to brain decline and neurodegeneration. Our brain requires more energy than any other organ in our body, so the brain really suffers. We'll see things like depression, ADD, ADHD, anxiety, mood alterations, lack of motivation, movement disorders, fasciculations, muscle spasms, you name it, neurodegeneration. Muscle wasting, because we're not absorbing our proteins, people with this don't absorb proteins and the nutrients that they need, the bones get brittle because we need lots of nutrients for bone and fatigue. You know, we, we need to absorb our nutrients to produce energy. Now this is a neurological problem. This is what uh, people need to understand. So with kids who have this, we're going to see like the spectrum disorders, ADD, ADHD, anxiety, Asperger's, and autism because of the effects of the brain. In adults, we're going to see things like memory loss, Alzheimer's, 
depression, anxiety, mood swings, obsessive compulsive disorders, vestibular problems, balance issues, vertigo, things like that, movement disorders, restless leg syndrome, spasms, fasciculations, uh, tremors, ADD in adults too, and seizure disorders, etc. Any kind of brain symptom. Now, the other thing that uh, gastroparesis is going to lead to is the breakdown of the gut barrier. We have this very important lining in our small intestine that keeps things out of our body that don't belong. When we have gastroparesis, the pH and the whole ecology of our gut changes and that barrier system breaks down. We, de we develop what's known as leaky gut syndrome or increased intestinal permeability. Now it's like, now we have like, uh, it's like having holes in your screen door on a hot summer day. Things are going to get into our homes that don't belong and we're going to go around trying to kill all the bugs when actually all we have to do is just really fix the screen door. The same thing happens in our, gas, in our small intestine. Once that lining of our barrier, the barrier, the one cell barrier between the inside of our gut and the inside of our body is, once it has little holes in it, then we're going to start, that's the gateway to autoimmune disease. So gastroparesis can be a trigger to autoimmune disease. Hashimoto's, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, celiac disease. So it's the gateway to autoimmune disease. Food sensitivities, larger than normal molecules of food will start to pass through the increased permeability of the gut, of the small intestine, and our immune system doesn't like heavy things in our, in our bodies. So it's going to start reacting to it. And that's going to create systemic inflammation. So we'll see things like achy joints, achy muscles, um, uh, certain markers in our blood work will be elevated, brain inflammation, brain fog, you know, lack of motivation, all the cognitive changes that can occur there. Now, how is this diagnosed? Now, this is a problem because many patients have come to me saying, I've been diagnosed with gastroparesis and they really don't have gastroparesis. It's just they may be constipated and the doctor's not really running the proper testing and truly uh, diagnosing this problem. The, 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 the definitive diagnosis for gastroparesis is the gastric emptying test, the four hour test. And basically they make you eat a certain amount of food. After one hour, 90% of it should still be in your stomach. After two hours, it should go down to 60%, four hours, 10%. And then after, uh, after that, all the contents should be out of our stomach. So if there's any delay in this, then the diagnosis can be made of gastroparesis. But you have to rule out blockages, and that's done with upper GI, with barium, upper GI studies, and endoscopy, the scope down in the mouth. All right, so many doctors misdiagnose this, and they just jump to that uh, conclusion that you got gastroparesis. It's kind of a diagnosis that's used flippantly, and, and you know, that's not really good. Now, the causes. Very important that we're clear on this. There's two types. Either the nerves that are in the stomach aren't working right. And that's pretty easy to diagnose. But the number one cause by far of that is type 2 diabetes or even type 1 diabetes. With diabetes, we get breakdown of peripheral nerves, nerves in the periphery. Clinically, what I've seen, I have never even seen a case of that, to be honest. Um, so the idiopathic gastroparesis, idiopathic means we don't know what, but we do know what it is. What it is, is the brain, the portion of the brain that controls the emptying of our stomach is not working. And that's what I want to talk about. And that's what traditional medicine doesn't look at. And we do from a functional neurological point of view. So the possible cause of idiopathic gastroparesis are poor vagus nerve function. Look, we have this nerve that comes from the lower part of our brain stem and it travels down to our heart, to our lungs, to our liver, to our stomach, to our pancreas, to our intestines. It's called the vagus nerve, V-A-G-U-S. This nerve is the highway between the brain and the gut and from the gut to our brain. It's a two-way highway, like taking I-57 from here to Chicago or you can take it back from Chicago. It's a two-way directional street. There is an intimate relationship between our brain and our gut and our gut and our brain. The two are intimately connected. What I've seen clinically is when people have the so-called idiopathic gastroparesis, they're having a problem with this vagus nerve. It's not working. These people will have other issues like maybe dry eyes, dry mouth, problems swallowing, snoring, 
heart palpitations, low blood pressure, high blood pressure, uh, constipation, a bunch of other issues that they'll have, tenderness in certain areas of the uh, gut. Uh, things that I mentioned right here. So with the vagus nerve, one of the things it does is it controls stomach contractions. It tells the stomach to contract. So when, the, when we have poor vagal output into the gut, for whatever reason, then we know that the, that the uh, stomach will not contract. And that is the cause of uh, gastro, idiopathic gastroparesis that your doctor is probably missing. But remember, the vagus nerve also controls other things like swallowing, acid production in the stomach, blood flow to the gut, motility of the intestines, the gut's immune system, and gallbladder and pancreatic function. So all these other things need to be addressed too. The medical solution to the idiopathic gastroparesis is simply to give you drugs that stimulate uh, the muscle of the stomach to contract. Um, and then they'll give you a, a drug called Reglin. Uh, erythromycin, which is really an antibiotic that will stimulate that. And anti-emetic drugs, like, you know, emetic means nausea. So anti-nausea drugs just to help you with the symptoms. Sometimes even Botox injections. They'll put Botox into this sphincter right here to get that to relax, okay? Um, not a real good long-term solution. Folks, they really don't have a lot to offer people with gastroparesis. So if you've got this and you're struggling with it, let me tell you, there's a lot of other solutions that your doctor may not be telling these people with this about. Functional medicine and neurology, which is my, uh, my expertise, um, solutions to idiopathic gastroparesis. We're going to uh, evaluate that lower part of your brainstem, this vagus nerve. One of the ways we'll do that, I don't know if you can see this on the video, is by looking at your gag reflex and the palatal elevation. This vagus nerve controls our gag reflex. So if, you ha if people have an excessive gag reflex or they don't gag at all, that's a sign of poor vagus functioning. Um, also people with this, um, they, their palate won't elevate. As you can see right here, um, this, we're having this patient say ah, 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 and we'll look at the palate to elevate. If the vagus nerve is working, the palate will elevate. You can see it's not on this right side. This person has a problem with their vagus nerve on the right side, not on the left, it goes really high. And then the punching bag, the uvula, will deviate to the good side. So we'll check for this on the neurological exam. We'll have bad gag reflexes, and we'll also listen to the bowel sounds. People with uh, poor vagus function, the bowel shuts down. That's why the stomach's not empty, so they don't have good motility. So this is the idiopathic form of gastroparesis that doctors don't really check for. Um, now, in my clinic, we have ways, to, so once we identify this, what do we do about it? Well, <laughs> we, the brain can be changed, folks. We can make brains that don't work. We can make them work by stimulating the neurons. And in my clinic, I have a book, uh, 32 Ways to Stimulate the Vagus Nerve. So once I evaluate a patient with gastroparesis, we'll figure out which of these 32 will give them a three or four that works for them, and we'll have them do these over a series of time Vagus function improves and the stomach starts emptying. They get better blood flow to the gut. Their gallbladder and pancreas start working. They start producing appropriate acids. They start making digestive enzymes. If they have high blood pressure, it comes down. They have, if they have snoring and things like that, that improves. So we can improve vagus tone by exercising these pools of neurons in the brainstem. The brain is just like a muscle. You know, if, if I have a weak muscle, I can make it strong by exercising it. And that's what functional neurology is all about. And so we can stimulate the vagus nerve. Many, many ways to do that. Functional medicine and neurology solutions to idiopathic. Now we also have to identify and remove gastric inflammation. People with gastroparesis, their, their stomach and intestines are inflamed. And that too can be a cause of why the brain isn't working. Remember, brain and gut are connected both ways. It's a two-way highway. People with bad guts get bad brain, and people with bad brain get bad guts. Um, there's multiple scientific studies that show that, and this is just neurology 101. Now, identify and remove gastric inflammation. We have to look at the patient. Do they have food sensitivities? Do they have infections? Many people with gastroparesis have multiple gut infections. And do they have leaky gut syndrome? We have to test for these and identify them. 
We have to repair the damage created by the gastroparesis. People who have this, if their foods are sitting too long in their stomach, have small ulcerations in the stomach. We have natural ways of fixing that. If, you, if people have this, they have nutritional imbalances because they're not absorbing. We have to identify those and fix them. Ulcers, leaky gut syndrome, dysbiosis where the, where the bacteria in our gut is off, and the neurological impairments. All this stuff can be uh, identified and addressed through natural care.